a bit on the physics input for stellar collapse models. Um, and I was going to go into some more detail, but since some, a lot of the physics overlaps with what Fritz just discussed, you've already gotten a, a, a huge bunch of uh, discussion on how do you do numerical hydrodynamics, how to do nuclear burning. And I'll do a little, uh, I, I'm, I'm, in the end I'm going to discuss neutrinos in a later lecture, but I'll talk about some of this physics in a little bit more detail. And then I'll end the lecture with some discussion on um, how we calculate remnant masses from core collapse supernova. Um, so, core collapse supernova requires some of the same physics as we need for almost any astrophysical problem. The hydrodynamics and turbulence that Fritz just spent um, quite a bit of detail describing an equation of state. Uh, in our case, we're in the conditions of dense nuclear matter we're reaching uh, the regimes where uh, you have to, you're, you're at nuclear densities where things like phase transitions from uh, one state of matter to another will matter, um, and that has proven to be <coughs> something that really pushes how our codes model the physics. Um, we have nuclear burning magnetic fields. Uh, our magnetic fields are likely to be more important than they are in type 1a supernova. General relativity is also likely to be more important than it is in uh, type 1a supernova, and definitely new, new neutrino, neutrino transport. So we don't have to worry in core collapse supernova, just as in type 1a supernova, about the photon transport in the engine. The radiation is trapped. When you have a density of 10 to the 14 grams per centimeter cube, the average photon is moving. If you have electrons in there, the average photon is not moving more than about um, 10 to the minus 14 centimeters. So it's not really making any moving during any time uh, in the calculation. But neutrinos have a much shorter mean free path, and they will travel quite far in the course of a calculation. Um, so this is kind of the physics that need to be needs to be added to your code. Typically, people do not add all of this physics uh, for things like general relativity. There's a lot of calculations that just use a post-Newtonian approximation, where you just take that leading term in the relativistic equations. For a lot of supernova, that's a good enough approximation. Um, magnetic fields, many calculations ignore them. Um, for neutrino transport, and I'll talk about this in some detail, we can use different levels of sophistication in how we model that neutrino transport. Um, and let me just go over some of this um, in some, uh, just give you a couple slides. So fluid mechanics, it's the same. Um, since Fritz gave you the Lagrangian formalism, I decided I'd give you some uh, a formalism, same way, but written if you were doing a Lagrangian code. Um, so. Uh, you have mass conservation, this all uh, Fritz covered, mass conservation, momentum conservation, energy conservation, um, and equation of state. So I gave examples of, just simple examples of all of these, where if, if you just, you know, the momentum conservation is just the, the, sorry, the, is the change in pressure, so if you have a pressure, you're pushing something, you have to get that acceleration. Energy conservation you can get just by PDV work. Um, and the equation of state, the simplest one is the gamma law. So it's a pressure is equal to gamma minus one times rho times the uh, specific energy. So this is what they, the equations look like if you're solving it in Lagrangian case. Um, and I thought I would go into some detail of where we care about, why we care about this hydrodynamics. Um, here's a, a uh, slice of a uh, collapse of a, a collapse core. And so it's collapsed and then the core is bounced. And now you're looking at the uh, various quantities, entropy, electron fraction, and uh, radial velocity as a function of radius in the core. Um, can I borrow your um, pointer? Oh, you have it right here. Um, so there's a couple features in this explosion that you want to keep track of. One is, here's the entropy. So the nice thing about um, entropy in deciding whether something is unstable is that the simple picture is just if I have a entropy that decreases as I extend out in radius, so if gra gravity is going this direction, entropy is decreasing as I go this direction, then I have something that's convectively unstable. So right here is a regime. Here's the, the stall of the shock. The shock is stalled right here. Um, Let's see, is there a way to see it? Yes. If you look at the velocity, this is the material falling in. It's then shocking. So this is that stall of that uh, shock front. Here's the entropy. 
in front of that stall, there's an entropy that's going down a little bit with radius. That's going to be convectively unstable to, uh, to Rayleigh-Taylor instability uh, convection. There's also another region where if you have, if you have something that is heavy on top of something that's light, it's also going to be convectively unstable. So the classic example of this is if you take um, salt water and put it on top of um, just fresh water. The salt makes it heavier. It wants to uh, sink down and uh, 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 convect. In this case, in the supernova case, we instead have something where we, it's a lepton instability, where the electron flat fraction, if it decreases with radius, with, against gravity, I now have, because the electrons are lighter than, say, neutrons, the electrons actually want to bubble up. The neutrons want to go down. So this region is unstable to lepton um, instabilities. Um, so we have two different regions where you could get convection. This is inside the proto-neutron star. This is around, um, it's 10 kilometers, about 30 kilometers. So this is inside the proto-neutron star. This is in that convective region. So we have two places where we've identified um, convective instabilities. This, was, this particular region has been known to be convectively instable for um, actually almost three decades now. Um, uh, and the idea was that this, this convection could help transport neutrinos out of the proto-neutron star, out of the core of the proto-neutron star, and let more neutrino heating happen. So this convection um, can help improve your neutrino uh, uh, flux at early times in a core collapse situation. This convection here is what kind of drove the uh, idea that you, need, you will have instabilities above that proto-neutron star, and this is what we've been focusing on more in the last decade or so as far as what is its effect on the supernova explosion. And it, it's this convection in this region that in the end drives the explosion. Now whether it's entropy driven or some other instabilities um, has yet to be, uh, I guess, fixed on or determined. So, but let's look at the convective instabilities just of that entropy driven um, picture and if you have some kind of entropy gradient, you can use something to calculate the, the growth time of that gradient. One of the simplest ways is to just look at the brunt weissala frequency, and this gives you a frequency so you can find the time, the growth time is one over the square root of this frequency for how quickly you will drive convection instabilities. And it's just given by the um, gravity force divided by density times the derivative of the density with respect to the entropy at constant pressure times the entropy gradient. So here if the, the um, entropy gradient is negative, this becomes a negative value which then tells you that's when you're unstable, is when this is, the frequency is um, irrational, or sorry, is uh, imaginary, that's when you have a instability. So whenever this goes negative, you get an instability. Um, you you then take the absolute value and you can get the time scale for the growth of this instability. This is a simplified, just looking at it in a uh, non-derivative format for what that rough um, time scale would be. If you go look at that, that small divot in this entropy and you ask what's the growth time for that instability, it's two milliseconds. Um, the reason it's important to calculate these growth times is that if you actually um, look at any simulation modeling core collapse supernova, we find that we do not grow at that brief two millisecond time. What's happening there is we have too much numerical viscosity and we're damping out that um, turbulence. So just as Fritz was worried about are we getting enough resolution to get the turbulence correct in type 1a supernova, we are in the same problem with that in um, core collapse supernova. Um, this is a field, this kind of turbulent field has been studied for ages. Um, there are huge calculations of the resolution needed to model just a simple turbulent uh, uh, simu uh, situation. In this case, it is just a entropy gradient uh, initial condition where I have low entropy material on top of high entropy material and I'm letting it grow. And these are the kinds of calculations people typically do are 8,000 by 8,000 by 1,000 zones calculations. 
in most core collapse simulations, we are not this resolved. And in fact, it hasn't been until recently that people are starting to resolve this. And even in this case, it's mostly in 2D. But here's some uh, set of calculations by Radice et al. in 2016, where they took what the standard kind of core collapse simulation resolution is, and they just continued to increase that resolution. And you can see, as they increase the resolution, new features appear, and the, the model is changing. So you, you're not, you know, without getting that resolution, you are not quantitatively correct. You can get an answer. Um, it can show you, uh, gen in general, and it can show you trends of what might happen, but getting high enough resolution is really critical in a lot of this hydrodynamic calculations. Um, the other thing that's important is things like the equation of state. Uh, and I just want to give another example of where equation of state has uh, led us awry. Uh, there, there were, for the longest time, people were focused on using equation of state by Latimer and Swesty, uh, and they used it all the way to low densities. But there was a bug in the uh, equation of state at low energies for the nuclear binding energies, where they had they were slightly off on the nuclear banding energies. Um, and so people didn't, they didn't naturally catch it. Um, it was conditions that were lower than they really worried about, it was densities below 10 to 9 uh, grams per centimeter cubed. When we started to study this uh, uh, equation study and we were looking at what kind of effects it, we had, we found this error in this energy and we corrected it. And the difference in the entropy profile went from something in this scenario to something in this scenario. And you can see the entropy gradient now is much different. We saw how fast the convection could grow, two milliseconds, when the entropy gradient looked more like this. When you had an entropy gradient that looked more like this, you got a very different answer. So making sure we have the equation of state feeds back in how we do the turbulence. So you do have to worry about, um, and if you look at the other quantities, they don't look all that different. So you wouldn't have noticed it unless you were focusing on entropy um, and looking at the turbulence. Um, so that's equation of state. That's an example of equation of state playing a role in the example of um, turbulence, how it can, um, uh, modeling it is something that's been hard for us. Another thing that we need to model is the neutrino transport. and. Um, There is a way that you could model all the matter. You can go to something called the kinetic equations, where you take every particle and say, I'm going to model it and actually transport it. Um, people do kinetic calculations where they look at everything, the electrons, the ions, the photons, neutrinos, all as individual particles that I'm going to transport. I'm going to move around, and I'm going to see how they calculate. The problem with doing that is typically if you want to take every particle and do it like that, you can only do a small box. It's very slow. Um, so we don't. We use those Euler equations for the hydrodynamics. We don't worry about transporting the electrons or the, the ions through this material. We just, we just let, the, we let these Euler equations decide, describe everything as an ensemble. And we can then use things like terms like pressure to describe the, the forces. For radiation, you can't, for neutrino transport, you can't get away with that. Um, so instead, people solve the Boltzmann transport equation, which is essentially tra transporting these, uh, the neutrinos um, in the, uh, throughout the matter. And it has a couple terms on it that I just would go through. This, is, this term is the time-dependent term. So you have, you have some um, intensity for the radiation and it's time dependent. It changes as a function of the source term. So if I have something that creates neutrinos, it'll change the, um, uh, it'll add to the neutrino population. It also has a term of scattering where material, uh, neutrinos are scattering into the angle and in, um, energy of whatever I'm calculating. Um, the issue when I talk about some intensity equation where I is my intensity is it's a function of both position and direction of that, the neutrino. So it's a six-dimensional quantity. 
Um, and then if I add the energy of that neutrino on top of it, it's a seven-dimensional quantity. So this starts to get to be a very detailed e equation. If I look at scattering, then I have, if I have a neutrino that's in this direction, but scatters in, so I'm worried about my intensity in this direction for the neutrinos. I have a neutrino in this direction, scatters into this direction. Now it's in that, uh, the same direction as those neutrinos. I'm gaining that flux. Um, there's the advection term of the neutrinos as they cross your boundary. So I lose as neutrinos leave that boundary. I lose neutrinos. If they come in, I gain neutrinos. And then the last term is just the absorption. And this is the absorption plus scattering. Because it, if it scatters, it scatters out of that angle. So I have to worry about this. So I had this seven dimensional equation that I have to solve. Um, if I, if I can do something with the energies, I can get it down to six dimensions. But it is a, a hard equation to solve. Um, and that is the goal of neutrino transport. The tricks that people use is one is they say, okay, this is too hard. I am going to angle average everything. So it makes everything nicer. I'm going to assume the neutrinos are roughly, they have some distribution set to them that is along the gradient of, of the, the intensity. So they will flow along the gradient. This is the simplest approximation you can make. What people do is they, they integrate that, they close, they, they, they then need to close that equation, so they've integrated over that omega. So I have these angle terms, I'm just gonna integrate over them and take them away from the equation. So I can remove those parameters in my equation, but then I have to somehow close the, the equation, and the simplest one is something like a flux limiter. So when people talk about doing flux limited diffusion, what they've done is they've thrown away the angular information. Um, there are ways to keep one level of the angular information, a lot of people have done these variable Eddington factor solutions, or you can solve the full transport where you've discretized the, the uh, angle information, and these can be done, the bolt strand is something Tony Metzikapo worked on, there's something called SN, which is just using um, a, a set of angular angle bins to, to, to divide up the angles. So it's uh, using some um, mathematical form formula to, to uh, put in those angles. And we'll talk a lot more about this when we do neutrino transport. Um, you need the higher level transport schemes if you want to include the detailed physics where you get things like uh, anisotropic scattering uh, features for the, the neutrinos. Um, so you need that to actually do the detailed calculations. The other way you can do this is you can actually transport it with Monte Carlo. So there are people working on Monte Carlo transport schemes. Um, and just to show how this can affect your calculations, um, these are calculations done by uh, Adam Burroughs' team um, where he was playing around with the electron scattering. He has a high order transport, but it's in 1D, and he's playing around with different uh, uh, neutrino physics schemes, uh, electron scattering schemes, and it's changing the position of the shock in this one day calculation by quite a bit over, over the course of time. So, so you get different um, solutions by just playing around with the neutri neutrino transport. Um, Thomas Shanka has also done this, um, where he played both with general relativity, neutrino cross sections and transport, and these are the range of answers he's getting by playing around with these, uh, these quantities. So you, and this is, uh, actually I should have said Yanka, it's actually Buras at all, but, um, but Thomas Yanka is in that group. Um, so they get a wide range of different answers depending on what they do with this physics. So this is the difficulty for core collapse supernova uh, theorists, is that as we add different pieces of physics, the answer changes. Sometimes it makes it easier to explode, sometimes it makes it harder to explode, um, and this is where you get people say, I can't get things to explode, and then it, two years later they go, oh yeah, it's easy to explode. They're adding just slightly, slight different f differences in the physics. Um, uh, magnetic fields, if you have strong magnetic fields, we've talked about this, they can uh, affect the flow. But even if they're not strong, the question I was asking uh, um, Fritz was, can I change the viscosity in the material? And you can. So even if they're not strong, they can change the viscosity in the material, and that changes the turbulence. Um, so this is the kind of basic physics behind uh, core collapse supernova. Um, almost all of them are important. Um, every time we look at them we, and add some level of detail, it changes the answer quantitatively. 
Um, and it makes it so it's difficult to say, okay, this star is going to actually explode and do something. We actually have to, we're still in the process where we just keep improving the physics. The good news is that everyone, we've kind of outlined the physics, and people are slowly improving the physics in their models as, they, as computers get more powerful. Um, so this is, this is a nice, nice kind of bimodal explosion produced through um, magnetic field calculations. But these are actually pretty strong magnetic fields. Um, now I wanted to end, uh, end my lecture talking about um, ways to somehow get an idea of what, uh, you know, more of the observational constraints on this explosion. So I just showed you it's hard, but we can go look at different quantities to constrain the results. We already used energy to give us an idea. We looked at the energy. We had to get explosion energies that were roughly, usually, 10 to the 51 ergs. That's a constraint on our models. Another constraint can be on the remnant masses. And to understand that, we have to understand fallback. So I want to re revisit the fallback discussion we've had earlier. Um, we call that the reason fallback, the, the first appearance of fallback as a, a, a property that could occur in supernova was back in the 1970s when Arnett and Truen argued that these dense conditions right above the proto-neutron star would neutronize the material and eject elements that were not appropriate for what we see in our galactic chemical evolution models. So they were not the right elements to explain um, the universe distribution of elements. So they argued that material can't get out. Their argument was, this is a flaw of the core collapse supernova engine. You have to do something to remove it, or this core collapse supernova doesn't work. Sterling Colgate responded by saying, yeah, all that material just falls back. It doesn't get out. And so these are early calculations by Sterling Colgate, where he has an explosion going out, but the innermost material, these are different mass shells. The innermost material doesn't make it out as a function of time. So this is a radius as a function of time and different mass shells moving out. So this mass shell moves out this far, falls back in. This mass moves out this far, falls back in. Sterling's idea was, once you launch the shock, the material in the proto-neutron star just accretes, and you send a rarefaction wave out toward that shock, taking away the energy. Another idea on that same note is, you have this material. Some of it is just not, it's moving out, but it's not moving that fast. And as it pushes the rest of the star, it falls below the escape velocity and falls back in. Um, one caveat, so this is how that came about. Thomas Young has argued that, oh, well, this, the, the electron fraction is actually reset by the neutrinos anyway, so it may not be, you may not need this material to fall back. So the, the original reasoning for why you need fallback may not be the right answer. Um, you may just be able to get it, um, you may be able to explode the whole star, and that material right near that proto neutron star can be reset. Um, it's, even though it's, it gets neutronized, the neutrinos can send the um, add those electrons back and actually make it so it does not produce bad nucleosynthetic yields. So um, even, w so it's, it's, although it's not necessary, we still see it happen in a lot of calculations. And here's a series of trajectories at different times for, this is as a function of a closed mass and this is velocity. Here's the initial explosion. You see it's moving out quite fast. All this material is moving fast. But as it moves out, this mater material decelerates and at some point, this material starts falling back at these later times. So I have a shock moving out, and this late time material is just falling back. It's just, it didn't have enough energy, and it slowed down as it pushed outward, and it fell back and drove fallback. So that's one way you can get fallback. That's kind of the Colgate idea. The alternative idea that people have pushed um, was this a shock deceleration idea. Um, Stan Woolsey pushed this very hard. It was, imagine the shock is moving out through a star. Um, you can actually derive the velocity of that shock as a function of time with the simplest of possible uh, analysis tools called unit analysis. And this is done, uh, the initial groups doing this were the Russian atomic weapon system, and they did the following approximation. They said the explosion, they, they know the units of the explosion energy. They're going to assume the explosion is going through a density medium that is some constant divided by r to some power omega. So this is the, the uh, equation, the two quantities they have. 
If they want to solve for the velocity as a function of time, well, what are the units of energy? Well, it's mass times radius squared divided by time squared. The units of this A value, because I'm going to end up wanting to write this in the terms of A, is mass over times density to the minus, uh, sorry, times rho r to the minus third power plus um, omega. Um, so I have the unit analysis. I can plug that in and just solve for r. So this is my radius for this shock as a function of time. So it's, it has a value of the energy, a value of this A, and then time to the 2 over omega minus 5 power. I can solve for the velocity just by taking this derivative, and I get an answer. Um, and surprisingly enough, to within less than a factor of 2, in fact, I think the solution for a lot of cases is like 1.2. You know, put a, a, this is really just proportional, but I put in some factor of about 1.2, and I get the right answer with this. This formula gives the right answer. All I did was unit analysis. Um, but it tells you one particularly important aspect. So getting the right numerical value is one, but the trends, it is very dead on, uh, on and it's the, um, uh, you can actually get the, looks like, I, no, I had this, I think this is right. Um, I think there's, there may be a switch in the 3 versus omega, but, uh, so there may be a minus sign here that's missing. But uh, the, the form of this equation is simply um, the, you know, something where it says as, as the value for omega, yeah, in fact, this is wrong. Uh, no, this is right. As the, if the value of omega drops below 3, so if you're going at, uh, if omega is 3, so it says the density is going down as the third power, so r to the third power, if it's going down like that, the shock goes constant. But if omega ever drops below 3, you suddenly start decelerating like crazy. And if you have a flat velocity, you will decelerate quite a bit. When the shock hits the hydrogen layer, where it's the density is fairly flat, you will get a deceleration and the shock will start to slow down that shock slowing down will cause material behind it to pile up and send a reverse shock back. You need this when you so solve any um, problem in uh, supernova remnants. They see the reverse shock. You, the shock is plowing through the interstellar medium. A reverse shock goes back. We see this in the interstellar medium. This solution solves that. Um, but Stan Woolsey argued that motion through the hydrogen layer would cause additional fallback, and you would see this. Um, so. What can we do when we try to solve this? Um, we can, you know, so we know there's various ways to make fallback. Can we actually model this? Um, the, the problem is it's hard to get these full quantitative calculations, so we usually try to do some kind of uh, simplification to calculate this fallback. Um, but we can do, you know, we can look at our, our equations again and say, okay, well, I have this much energy. This is the binding energy that I have to drive off. If I have less explosion energy than the binding energy, I'm likely to get fallback. And that's essentially the essence of this kind of calculation. Say, OK, well, we know we must get some fallback if we have weak explosions. Um, but depending on how you deposit the energy, you can get a range of results. So here's three different uh, progenitors. The blue is 25 solar mass progenitor. The red is a 20 solar mass progenitor. And the green is a 15 solar mass progenitor. And in, in these models, different amounts of energy were injected, and they were injected in different ways. So you could have, you know, you could either say, I, I have a proton neutron star, I'm depositing energy. Um, there's a, a large group of people that just do a thing where they put a piston and they drive off the explosion. Another way you can do it is by pick a region and deposit energy and drive an explosion. You can also say, I'm going to turn up the neutrino flux, because in 1D we never get explosions. I'm going to turn up the neutrino flux and let it deposit more energy and drive an explosion. Or I can increase the neutrino cross-section. That will let me deposit more neutrino energy and drive an explosion. There's lots of ways to do this. Um, in this particular set of models, I played around with a lot of parameters for driving explosions and asked the question, what kind of results I can get? And for the same, there's a general trend as the energy gets more, is stronger, the remnant mass goes down. This is the baryonic remnant mass, so the gravitational mass will be about 15% lower. But as I increase the energy, 
the, the remnant mass goes down, you get less fallback. So here there's a lot of fallback, here there's very little. This is roughly where the um, proto-neutron star was at the time of the explosion. The, um, you, but you can also see that there's a set of models here, some 25 solar mass models, that are weak explosions, but still have not the same remnant mass. That was just on how you introduce the explosion. So models that actually produced one foe, two foe explosion models for a 25 solar mass star, the feature that these models had is they were injecting energy even at late times. So if you do a neutrino thing where you increase the uh, neutrino scattering cross, cross section and you're just depositing energy from neutrinos, they will occur to late times. You will be depositing energy out to 10 seconds. You will not get much fallback and you will end up forming a low mass remnant. But if your neutrino engines, neutrino energy deposition stops once you drive an explosion because there's no more material to deposit energy in, you will end up getting a, a situation where you get a lot of fallback. Um, do we, do we know from our 3D calculations that we have fallback? Here's an example of a 3D simulation um, where you, you follow the, the evolution. The shock is moving out, but even as the shock starts moving out, flows are coming down and adding mass onto the proto-neutron star. In fact, it's so bad that it maybe is a misnomer to say that f it's fallback. It's not material moving out and then falling back. It really is continued accretion in the supernova engine. So here's a late time calculation by Tony Matsukapa's group. This is Tony Matsukapa here. This is a colleague of his, Bronson Messer. Uh, I, I found another, I couldn't find it again. I found a plot where Bronson has his arms crossed like he's gonna beat up Tony for something. Um, uh, but, and Bronson is a former football player at University of Tennessee, so do not piss him off. He's a big guy. Um, but but it, these guys work a lot together. These are calculations that they've done together. This is at late times. The shock has already moved out to 1,000 kilometers. So it's actually expanding quite a bit. But you still see downflows happening. So you still see matter accreting. So I think fallback happens. Um, it, you either call it fallback or continued accretion. But uh, it, it's happening in our 3D models. Um, and you see it when we do models where we launch an explosion, but then model in 3D, there's this pause because we are artificially driving the explosion, but immediately it starts, material starts falling back, and this is the accretion rate as a function of time, and it accretes and then keeps on accretion, uh, accreting, but falling off to the power of t, t to the minus five-thirds power. This t to the minus five-thirds power was derived by Roger Chevalier um, in the, probably the 80s, maybe early 90s, it's a simple, if you, if you drive a shock through something, you expect to have material falling back. So this is just, what's the escape velocity? It will fall back at a time scale um, that ends up producing this t to the minus 5 thirds power. Um, it's, a, it's a generic s solution you expect in all cases. This is the kind of fallback you expect. Um, it should happen in most hydrodynamic calculations. Um, this feature right here, that's the reverse shock. That's accretion from the reverse shock. So you both get this Colgate idea and the Woolsey idea for how you can get accretion. Um, the real issue is how much matter do you get? In these particular calculations, you can see I'm accreting at 10 to the minus two solar masses per second for about 100 seconds. So I'm accreting um, almost a solar mass of material in some of these calculations. Um, this was a, a massive star um, with a fairly weak explosion. The explosion is actually asymmetric in this case, so you're seeing accretion through an asymmetric explosion. Um, so fallback occurs, that's going to be one of the ingredients for determining what the remnant mass is. Um, an interesting aspect of fallback is if you do get fallback and you send material back down onto the proto-neutron star, you now have a condition that's not so different than your supernova in the first place. I have material piling up on a neutron star. The neutron star is still hot during this fallback case. It's happening in the first few seconds. And you have material falling down in. It's depositing more energy as it accretes onto the proto-neutron star. If there's any kind of angular momentum in this system, it will drive an outflow. So this is a neutron star. This is material accreting. And the accreting material, some of it, a fraction of it, about 25%, is now getting flung back out. So if you have fallback, you're also going to have a longer duration explosion because the material falls back and keeps on driving energy. This is actually why the supernova community is confused by this because they actually 
if you talk to Thomas Yonko or Tony Mitsukapa, they just call this the continuing aspect of the supernova engine. Because fallback is really just um, adding more uh, uh, energy to the supernova. Um, it's happening in the first uh, 10, you know, 1 to 100 seconds. It's doing this, uh, uh, it's just adding to the energy. Um, this is if it were a black hole. In a black hole case, it just all creates on, even though there's angular momentum in the simulation. So even with high angular momentum, unless it's really high and you can form a disk, the black hole just accretes the material. Um, this is not enough energy to power, uh, you know, drive the explosion by itself. You need a, 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 an explosion launched already, but it is enough to change the energetics of the supernova. Um, the ejecta actually has uh, um, interesting nucleosynthetic yields as it uh, as it accretes it some of it becomes neutron rich it doesn't go all the way down to the neutron drip line this is the neutron drip line where you can't add any more neutrons but it gets down a ways and it the, the free neutrons actually capture pushing you all, all the way up to the third peak for the uh, R process so it's possible that this fallback accretion can produce the R process. Um, and uh, I'll just let it run out until it cools. So that's the end. Um, so this is what the you know, sig signature can look like. This is, this is the, that, that material's element abundance. It's not a great fit to the R process, but it's producing R process-like elements. Um, so you can get some uh, R process elements from fallback, um, but it's uh, uh, it can't, I, I don't think it can explain all of the R process. Um, so we have, we have fallback that happens. It, you know, there's ways of testing it. There's things like nucleosynthetic yields. We can look to see if we understand it. 3D supernova si simulations can tell us about it. Um, the problem is getting a quantitative number is hard. Um, so what we've typically done to get remnant masses is, and, and the problem is if I just take a 1D code, I can get a range of answers for the remnant mass. So what we typically do is um, try to estimate it from our understanding of the engine. So we go back to the simple level where we have this convective engine. I have infalling pressure. I know I can, the energy that I'm gonna have in this convective engine is on par with when its pressure is enough to drive out an explosion. So again, I'm, I'm being simple here. I'm not worrying about fallback energy injection. I'm just saying, okay, let's, let's see what kind of energies I can get. That's the derivations I showed you yesterday where we can derive the convective energy. We can then predict the explosion energies. You can then look as a function of progenitor and compare it to the binding energy here. So we can go back to this binding energy, compare to this binding energy and ask the question, what kind of remnant mass will I get? I just say, if I, I say I eject all the material that uh, has a binding energy less than what I have available, anything inside falls back in and makes a remnant mass. You can then predict remnant masses as a function of progenitor. Um, and this is, these are three different plots. This is Lemogi and Chieffe, um progenitors. This is Woolsey and Hager progenitors. Um, these are two progenitors from Patrick Young. Um, and you can see this is, some of this noise is that noise Friedel was talking about where you can get slightly different silicon burning that changes the ion core mass. So you see some noise. This is uh, for solar metallicity. So this drop off is because of winds. The reason this one doesn't drop off so much is Lumungi and Kiefi have um, less strong winds. But in this general region here, there's a, you know, there's a trend. They seem to agree because their structures aren't so different. Um, there's some noise here. Um, but this is the general features of these uh, explosions. You can then extend this by looking at different metallicities, looking at higher masses. And the simple, if you take that simple model and then fit, again, I typically ignore the noise and you fit to these models, you can get a distribution of remnant masses. Um, this dip here is caused by this dip in the around 20 to 24 solar mass range in the Woolsey-Hager models where they, their iron core actually gets smaller as you go up in mass um, based on different uh, burning. And then these different curves are for different metallicities. The red, green, and blue are different metallicities from Woolsey and et al. Um, stellar models. So you, and if you look out, you can even make masses, predict masses up to 
um, 8,800 solar masses and make predictions for not just neutron star masses or, but black hole masses. Um, so we've done that. Then the next question would be, how does that compare to observations? Um, um, so here what we've done, right, we, we've, we've said, okay, the, the doing a quantitative simulation for first principles is hard. Let's just take the basic model of the convective engine and make some predictions for the uh, neutron star and black hole masses. The first thing that we thought we should try and fit is the distribution of neutron star masses and black hole masses. So here's the function, the, the mass, the remnant mass, and this is the number. Um, for on top here is the observations. So observed are neutron star masses that range from about one solar mass up to two solar masses. This is the distribution of um, neutron star remnant masses. Um, recall that when this convective engine first came out, it was predicting a range of masses. And at the time, the observations predicted a delta function for mass. So this range of mass now in the observations agrees well with the, with the theory, um, but it took some time for, for the observations to, to catch on. The black hole masses also have a distribution that range from about five solar masses on up to, to 14 solar masses. And, and uh, so you see these are all observed in black X-ray binaries for the most part. Um, these, there's some neutron star, a lot of these are in binary neutron star systems, but the rest are in X-ray binaries as well. So this is the distribution, of, observed distribution of, um, of uh, the remnant masses. This magenta line here was the theory prediction circa 2005 or so um, from just doing the simple models. The one feature you should see here is this magenta curve. There's a peak. There's a lot of neutron stars being made at, at the mass, this around the 1.4 solar mass range. But it then drops off and still has a steady uh, distribution of masses from three all the way up to 12 solar masses. It's a little bit harder to make a 14 solar mass star, but it, it, a 14 solar mass black hole, but you get that range of masses. What you don't see in this theory prediction is this gap between neutron star masses and black hole masses. At this point, observational astronomers are pretty sure this gap is real. So there's a true gap in this model. So the, the, the kind of theory prediction by this basic simulation predicted the range of neutron star masses, but it did not predict, predict the gap. So what that you can then do is go the opposite direction and say, I have these observations. What does that tell me about the explosion mechanism? And what it says is that either you get a pretty strong explosion or you, don't get a, you get a very weak explosion or no explosion at all. And to do that, if you put that into your, your model, you get this red curve and you can reproduce the gap. So you can reproduce the gap, but what it says is I either explode in a strong manner or I have a very weak explosion or no explosion at all. So you have to somehow, somehow the engine has to produce that. We don't know how that can happen yet. But this is just, but that's what the model seems to be requiring. Um, if you then also compare these distributions to the, uh, if I just look at the neutron star masses in detail, here are the distributions predicted for the pulsar, the first neutron star formed, and the companion neutron star in the double neutron star systems. These are the distributions predi predicted by population synthesis. These are the observed masses. It looks like we're a little bit low on the mass for these proton neutron stars, but we're off only by about, at most, 0.1 solar mass in explaining these observed uh, uh, neutron star binaries. Um, so we're, it looks like we're getting a reasonable fit for even the neutron stars in these systems. Um, so that's, we kind of knew what we were doing to do neutron star masses, but what would we do if we said we want to know about all the um, mass distributions and I really want to look at black holes? What can I predict that then there's going to be an observation? And the prediction that we realized we could do is what would advanced LIGO see? Um, so here is the Belchinsky et al. 2016, but submitted in May of 2015. So this paper was submitted prior to any the light advanced LIGO even going up. This was the prediction that um, Belchinsky et al. Um, uh, made for the black hole, the distribution of remnant masses for merging binaries. This 
Spike right here is the neutron, this is the merger rate density. So the higher this is, the more mergers you're gonna have. This is the, so there's a spike here, the, the largest spike is neutron star mergers. Um, but then there are um, a, a series of black hole, black hole binary mergers that you expect. And you see that they're peaking around, this is the total binary mass. So this would be two 25 solar mass stars or a 20 and a 30 solar mass star, but it's, any, it's, it's the total mass closer to the chirp mass that you might see. Um, the difference between the red and magenta curve and this black curve is metallicity. So at high metallicity, you don't expect any really huge systems that are black hole, black hole binaries, and it moves the curve in toward masses around, um, total masses around 20, 30 solar masses. So it's two 10 solar mass black holes. That matches the solar system black holes we see that are more around 10 solar masses. It's because the metallicity is higher and you don't make the, the really massive systems. Um, you could also rule out some of these if you had parent stable supernova. In the case of these models, Chris Bocinski had not included um, the fact that some massive stars will go parent stable and not produce a black hole at all. So this is the predictions um, he made. So he's expecting to see some distribution around here. Um, submitted the paper. Oh, this blue line is the LIGO sensitivity. So even though there's lots of neutron star mergers made, unfortunately the sensitivity of LIGO, because it's, it's easy for, easier for it to detect more massive um, binaries, it can see those further out. Because the neutron star mergers can't be seen that far out, that sensitivity for advanced LIGO says that it's going to be very hard to detect uh, neutron star mergers. So there could be a lot of neutron star mergers, but they're, they're very hard to detect with advanced LIGO. Um, so this is the, the predictions he made. Then we had advanced LIGO detect its first black hole binary. Um, this is uh, the LIGO team that spent a lot of time coming up with a great ways to sift through the data and extract hard to see signals, signals that are buried in the noise. This was their first signal. It was, the, you, you could see it by eye. In fact, the team that was doing the templates for the binaries did not discover it. It was the team that actually just was just looking for any kind of transient because you could see this by eye. So this is the signal in Hanford. This is the signal in uh, Livingston. This is, the, this is what a theory might predict. And they really do align right along with the theory. They predicted a nice, uh, beautiful black hole mass, a pair of masses. They could get a lot of information from this first detection. They have since had other detections where the, the signal was much more in the noise. And in this case, their detailed uh, statistical analysis, their template analysis is actually being the, the workhorse to helping them find more systems. But I just want to show this particular black hole mass in the system. It is right, it was right here. The total um, redshifted binary mass was around 70 solar masses. Um, this is a paper by Chris Bocinski in Nature. Um, of 2016, and it's, it's in this realm of the masses that were predicted by the population synthesis using these, this basic simple model for how we make remnant masses. So using the same picture that we made for remnant masses. The other system that's been discovered is a lower mass black hole, black hole binary. So it's down in this region. So they've actually now detected um, if the two, the two golden ones are in here, um, hopefully they'll start publishing the results for the current science run and we'll see where those black hole masses are. So the black hole mass distributions are now being compared. Um, the rate of black hole binaries, this is the rate predicted by the first run of the LIGO um, simulation. So it's fairly uncertain rate, but it's within, these are three different population synthesis models. So as you can see, you can get a range of results and the rate is within this range of population synthesis models. So, so the rate is roughly on par with what the population synthesis is modeling, but the mass more particularly calculated from our understanding of remnant masses is right along what these models predict. So we, you know, we, we, we went, we tried to do, you know, we, we said, what, what do we know from this simple model? We tried to do calculations, serious calculations um, to model the, uh, the, remnant masses, we found that there's a lot of uncertainties. Uncertainties in the engine make it very difficult to say this is going to be the remnant mass. But if we just take a simple picture and 
predict remnant masses. We could predict a range of neutron star masses like we see in observations. Um, we could predict um, a range of black hole masses that seemed to match the LIGO results. The thing we didn't predict at all was that mass gap. And in fact, for the longest time, I thought the mass gap was going to go away. If that mass gap is real, it tells us something about how the engine works. And hopefully, that will feed back into our models of understanding the 3D explosion. Um, but it's, this, is, this, this problem is truly a multi-physics problem. And uh, including all the physics first principles is, is a, an effort that we are working on, but it's something that is a steady effort, where people are slowly improving their physics, slowly uh, uh, getting higher resolution to try and get this physics um, to match the data better. Um, um, and with that, I will just say that so tomorrow, we'll start talking about another observational constraint, which is supernova asymmetries, and we'll go in detail on that. And with that, I'll end for today. Uh, about the black hole mass distribution. When we looked first uh, into explosion models, I think the general understanding was that maybe about 20, 25 solar masses you produce black holes. So if you see six solar mass black holes, it means that they lost their masses at hydrogen and helium envelopes during the stellar evolution. Yeah, so the binary properties population systems models include that effect. In fact, the x-ray binaries, you don't see, none of the ones that you would see will have still held on to their hydrogen envelope um, by the time they collapse. So they, they're usually in such close binaries that we're expecting to lose at least the hydrogen envelope in, that, uh, in a common envelope phase. And so you, when you're collapsing, even though I started with a 25 solar mass star when I was collapsing, I was down to what the hydrogen, I'm uh, sorry, the helium core mass was. So Sometimes that. you would expect to get up to 20 solar masses. Yeah, and so we don't, and so that's why it's very hard to make those more massive systems because they, to, to do that, you, 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 you don't get the whole star mass because you almost always in these close binaries, even in the binaries for, uh, um, these black hole, black hole binaries, the really massive ones that I, I was showing for the LIGO events, those were all produced in stars that lost their hydrogen envelope. So I had to actually start for the, um, for the, the 30, 30 or 40 solar mass black hole, I had to start with a low metallicity star that was more like you know, 70 solar masses. And then, um, and then I lose the hydrogen envelope and I get what's left. Um, and, so, and so then again, it depends it back on stellar evolution, because how much mass they convert, how much of the hydrogen they burn before it goes into the giant phase makes a big difference on what kind of mass I can make the black hole. Um, so we, we, we do our best by fitting the models, that, the stellar models that exist, and we make predictions. Another question? Yes. I have a very naive question about the fallback. Uh, is it due to the lack of, uh, of energy, or is it due to the fact that the energy is not released fast enough so that you have kind of the problem of the relative instability, that it goes faster than the, the extension of the Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the initial pictures were, it was just due to the lack of energy. I'm moving out, and the materials just doesn't have enough energy to, it, its velocity is below the escape velocity, or it gets decelerated as it pushes up against it, and it decelerates below the escape velocity. But what we see in the 3D models is a combination of there is some material that gets a high velocity, enough to escape, even at the same mass coordinate. Some of the material is getting out. The other material is just not getting enough energy, and it's falling back. So it's, and so it, it's not really Taylor developing, but because I have an asymmetric explosion, there's some material that is just not, it's moving out, but not at the escape velocity, and it goes back down. And it starts doing that almost immediately. So you have the explosion, this explosion is being turbulent, and there's accretion, and now it's still moving out, and there, some material gets pushed up, but it comes back down. And so the, the fallback starts occurring be, in part because the explosion, it, it occurs because material's not getting enough energy, but part of the reason it's not getting enough energy is because we have this turbulent engine, this convective engine, that is driving some material at high velocities and some material at lower velocities, I guess is the way to say it. And so we see fallback from the beginning of the launch of the shock, and it just keeps on accreting.
this. Considering this gap uh, in observations, if we suppose that in nature there is no gap, could be some selection effects, probably observational selection effects that can explain this gap? Yeah. So. I was convinced it was an observational bias uh, for the longest time, and the bias was a simple one, which is if you were a black hole uh, modeler and you, got, you measured a black hole mass and its error bar was, so most of the error bars on these systems, which I'm not showing here, is, are pretty big. And if the error bar made it so it could be a neutron star or a black hole, you tended to not care because it wasn't a sure black hole. Versus a system, and if you were a neutron star observer and you saw a system where the error bar made it a black hole, you also didn't care as much because you thought, okay, this is not a neutron star. So you would ignore some of those systems. There's a whole bunch of systems here and here whose error bars could be filling in this gap, especially in the black hole side. So there are error bars on some of the observations that could be filling in the gap. Um, um, so there, there are systems for sure that could be in there. Um, when people do the analysis, they somehow place it wherever they place it. But the, within the error bars, there could be no gap at all. Um, they have done, they, the observers have argued that they've looked in detail at this. They've looked at the error bars. They've done real statistic analyses. And they argue that the gap is real. Um, so at the moment, there's not, um, th they have argued that there won't be a gap there for sure. Um, but these were the same observers that argued to me that neutron stars were all at a dump, delta function mass um, uh, 20 years ago, and black holes were all at a del delta function mass, and they said that's what they were. Um, so, uh, and now they do believe that there's a distribution of neutron star masses. So, so you know, I, I, I'm, I'm willing to believe the observers until um, they, they change their mind on me. Um, but the, the, the biases that I thought they would have, they've argued, they've looked at, and there's no biases anymore. The gap should be real. Um, uh, so uh, I, I'm trusting them at face value on that for the moment. Last question, please. Uh, you have another question, probably not so close to connect to this, but your population synthesis, synthesis for neutron star mergers, which rate it predicts? Um, the, there's a range predicted for uh, y using the both models that Beltinsky has done, models that I've done. Uh, it's around, and unfortunately the error bars are huge. So the, the range is, goes from 0.0, uh, so in per mega year in a Milky Way mass galaxy, it's about point, I think Chris Wolczynski's were ranging from about 0.05 to about 80 per mega year per Milky Way mass galaxy. Um, my models were more like 0.02 to about 80 um, uh, neutron star mergers per mega year per Milky Way mass galaxy. Um, the, uh, the, if, if I, if I limit, so the game, oops, go the wrong direction. If I say I have, if I say that black hole, the black hole merger rate tells me something, um, I can look at the models, between the models that actually fit the, the black hole rate data and those probably have a neutron star merger rate between 1 and 10 uh, neutron star mergers per mega year per Milky Way mass galaxy. So 10 to minus 5, 10 to minus 6 neutron star mergers per year in the Milky Way is what most of our population synthesis models predict. Um, Going back to the observations of the concrete objects, probably there is a bias there due to the black holes of these people. Actually, binding, so these are creating black holes. So their mass is not the, the birth mass. It is true, but they don't gain that much mass in the accretion. So um, we can't take a black hole born at three solar masses and put it up to five. They don't accrete that much mass. So there is some mass accreted. Um, in low mass X ray binaries, it can be more mass. 
um, a si more significant amount of mass. But in high mass X-ray binaries, the arguments are they don't accrete that much mass. Um, and a lot of these systems are high mass X-ray binaries. Okay, let's thank Chris again.